Welcome to the Mindspace Podcast. I'm Joe Flanders. The Mindspace Podcast is my personal, in-depth exploration of the most inspiring science, philosophy, and practices of well-being. My purpose with this project is to help us all move toward a healthier, more joyful, and more meaningful life for ourselves and our communities. Join me as I learn and share the most impactful insights about human flourishing from leading experts in a variety of fields. This is a very special episode of the Mindspace podcast for a few reasons. Number one, we're doing this episode for Bell Let's Talk Day, so January 30th, 2019. As many of you know, this is a big day for mental health in Canada. Bell raises money for mental health initiatives by donating five cents for every text, call, and social media share on the topic. And believe it or not, they are closing in on $100 million raised since 2010. They're investing in anti-stigma, care and access, research, and workplace health. And obviously, these are all priorities that I support, and so I'm proud to associate with the campaign. Number two, Bell Let's Talk actually funded a project spearheaded by my guest today. More on that in a moment. And number three, this is actually the first anniversary of the launch of this podcast. We launched on Bell Let's Talk Day last year. And today's episode is number 12. Uh, it's been such a fun and enriching experience for me. And I really hope that listeners are appreciating what we've done so far. And so for all of these reasons, we needed a big name for this episode. And I feel like we really nailed it with my guest today. That's Professor Sonia Lupien. Sonia is a full professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the Université de Montréal. And she's also the founder and director of the Center for Studies on Human Stress. Sonia is a highly prolific research scientist with dozens of publications in some of the top journals in her field. In recent years, though, she has dedicated some of this ambition to making her scientific discoveries more accessible to the public. For example, she set up a website, humanstress.ca, to explain all of her lab's findings in accessible language. She published a best-selling book on stress called Par Amour du Stress, or Well Stressed in English. She appears regularly on TV and radio. And she recently released a stress management iPhone app called iSmart, which I alluded to earlier, um, as it was funded by Bell Let's Talk. We'll put all this info in the show notes so you can follow up as you see fit. So I really enjoyed talking to Sonia. Her enthusiasm on the subject matter is contagious, and she's really smart. We covered a range of topics, including the basics of stress physiology, uh, one of her current projects on stress and social media, practical tips for stress management, and everything in between. Just before we get to the interview, I just want to invite you to share this episode on social media. Of course, we appreciate you doing that at any time, but if you're listening and sharing on January 30th, you'll be contributing to funding some outstanding mental health initiatives. And we'll post instructions on how to do that in the show notes. And finally, if you are struggling with stress in any way, please feel free to reach out to Mindspace for info on our therapies, mindfulness trainings, and workplace programs at mindspacewellbeing.com. And now, here's my interview with Sonia Lupien. Okay, I'm here with Sonia Lupien. Sonia, welcome to the podcast. Nice to be here. It's a real pleasure to have you here, and um, I'm really excited to ask you a bunch of questions and learn a bunch about stress and how we can leverage all this amazing scientific knowledge you've accumulated over the years to help us improve our well-being and our mental health. I like to start by just asking guests who you are and what do you do? Well, I'm a researcher. I've been working on the effects of stress, particularly stress hormones. So I will explain to you, I guess, a bit later how it works. But basically, I'm measuring the effects of stress hormones on the brain and by extension on behavior in people, you know, across the entire lifespan. I've done studies in children, teenagers, adults and older adults. 
Okay, so stress hormones, my first association there is cortisol. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the areas that you uh, do research in? Yeah, I've been working a lot on cortisol. And I just want to add right here that cortisol is not the only stress hormone. I mean, it's not the stress hormones, you know. So uh, there are many, many others. But uh, compared to other hormones, uh, cortisol is uh, steroids, which means that it's small and very greasy. So it crosses the blood-brain barrier, you know, this barrier around our brain uh, that protects it from the outside. So these stress hormones uh, will cross the brain uh, barrier very easily and access brain regions involved in learning and memory, emotional regulation. And this is why I'm so interested in these hormones, because it has a very important impact on the brain. I see. So this is, it, it can affect how we think and how we behave and this sort of thing because it crosses the blood-brain barrier. It accesses the brain, yeah. Okay. So my understanding is that cortisol is one element uh, of the HPA axis, which if I understand is a very important um, biological system when it comes to understanding and describing stress. Can you tell us a bit about what the HPA axis is and what, what its role is in in human homeostasis? Yep. So the HPA axis stands for hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and it's the machine behind the stress response, basically. So the way it works, it's quite simple. Each time your brain detects a threat, you know, a threatening information out there that we call a stress, uh, it will lead to the production of CRF, you know, corticotropin releasing factor from the hypothalamus, so the what we call the master gland. And this, uh, so CRF will go into the circulation access the pituitary gland and when it accesses the pituitary gland it will lead to the production of ACTH uh, adrenocorticotropin hormones and then this hormone will go into the bloodstream uh, and will access the adrenal glands which are two small glands located on top of your kidneys and when the adrenal glands receives the message from ACTH it will lead to the production of glucocorticoids and one of the main type of glucocorticoids in humans is cortisol so this will lead to the production of cortisol and cortisol is there not to stress you really I mean because why would the body create something that is negative because everyone thinks stress is negative and I'll try to show you that it's not the case all the time but basically because the stress hormone is very necessary for you to survive because it will give you the energy you need to do the only two things you can do in front of the stress or you fight or you get away you can freeze but freezing is not a good way to survive i mean it's more of a traumatic response than a stress response we think these days but basically this hormone will help you deal with the stressor and survive how does it help? Is this because it's metabolizing energy or something? It is metabolizing energy. It helps you take the glucose that you have stored, you know, everything you eat, uh, et cetera, the, the lipids and the glucose you have stored. It helps you take it and use it to have the energy you need to. Because, you know, for example, when you're stressed out, you're very strong. You're much stronger. You know, a woman could be able to lift a car to save her two children stuck in, you know, in an accident and there's a big truck coming, for example. So uh, you have a lot of energy in order to allow you to do the only two things you can do. Again, if you want to survive, you fight, which takes a lot of energy, or you get away and uh, you, 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 know, you run as fast as you can. So when people report in very intense experiences, traumatic experiences, or highly stressful experiences that they felt more like stronger or more powerful than they normally would. That's essentially because of cortisol. Yeah, we think it's because of these hormones and possibly with the help of many, many other hormones. I mean, this is a system. Just realize that the HPA axis right there has three structures involved. You have the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the adrenal cortex. And you have many, many, many other structures involved in this uh, response. And, and it's the concerted action of all of these substances that will give you uh, the best stress response you need to survive. Okay, so I'm going to take us a little bit further down the rabbit hole because I'm curious about something. I once learned probably in grad school that cortisol acted as a kind of negative feedback or a kind of a braking system on the HPA axis. And if we have a lot of cortisol through in our bloodstream, it's because it's trying to slow down the HPA axis. Is that accurate? 
It's a beautiful system, actually, because the same stress hormones that you produce can stop stop itself. And I'll explain this. Let's say you have, you know, something very important, a big stressor, and you're, you're producing a lot of stress hormones in order to, you know, fight or get away. Uh, and then you get away. But you want this stress response to stop. If not, you're going to die. <laughs> mm -hmm. So how, how does it work? Well, the same stress hormones that you have produced, glucocorticoid, since it is liposoluble, meaning it can access the brain, it will go back to the brain and tell the, adri the, the pituitary gland, stop producing ACTH, I'm fine. And then it will go back up to the hypothalamus saying, okay, it's fine, stop producing CRF. And then you will have a significant decrease of CRF, a significant decrease of ACTH. And if you have no more ACTH to go activate the adrenal gland to produce glucocorticoids, you're going to have a nice, what we call the recovery period where, you know, the glucocorticoids, the cortisol in the bloodstream will decrease and you're back to what we call the basal cortisol levels, which is your baseline levels that day before, you know, you ended up in a car accident or something like that. I, I think this is so important because I think uh, on a sort of day-to-day -day basis or, or in common parlance around cortisol, people think, oh, you have high cortisol, you must be highly stressed. But it's impossible to understand the implications of high cortisol without understanding sort of the dynamics. It might be high because uh, it's appropriate for a highly uh, demanding situation, and it might be on the way down, it might be on the way up. So this is much more complex than just saying, oh, I'm stressed, so I have high cortisol. Yes, and this is my new uh, interest these days, what we call stress mindset. What I mean by that is that most people would think that stress is negative. So each time you say, I have high level of cortisol or I'm highly stressed, everyone thinks they're going to die. Stress is absolutely necessary for survival. If you didn't have a stress response, we would all be dead by now. So there, are, there is as much positive effects of stress and cortisol than they are negative. Actually, when you study this as I did, there is an inverted U-shape uh, function between the level of stress hormones in the bloodstream and its impact on performance, behavior, etc. So uh, an increase, of, uh, a small increase on, of cortisol is good. You want this. And at a certain point of resistance, then it's going to start to have negative effects. So it's not because you're measuring high level of cortisol at 10 a.m. this morning that something is going necessarily wrong. You may be producing a stress response because you have an exam coming in, and this is a, this is good. Why? Because these stress hormones, by accessing your brain, will increase your vigilance, will increase your attentional process, may increase the recall of the information you learned before, and this is exactly what you need to have a good score on your exam. Now, if you're too much stressed, then you're going to go on the right, the right hand side of the inverted U-shape function. All your ideas will be all mixed up in your head and you, you know, you're going to have problems remembering stuff. And this is when your score will decrease. And we've been trying to find this resistant point, you know, when the good effects of stress become the bad effects for about 25 years. And uh, unfortunately, we have not found it yet. That's super interesting. I, I'm really grateful to you for educating people about the upside of stress. And one of the things I talk to my clients uh, quite a bit about is this, is our mindset about stress. Mm -hmm. And you can let me know if this is um, a little over the top, but um, I remember hearing about a study recently. It was a large epidemiological study in the US. I think there was like tens of thousands of participants in it, followed them over many, many years. And they were looking at predictors of mortality over a 30-year time frame or something like that. And one of the significant predictors of mortality, let, let's say early mortality, was a belief about stress, that stress is bad. And I'm going to assume for the moment that they controlled for many of the other predictors of mortality. But the implication was, if you're able to view stress in your life as mix or a positive thing, you're going to be sort of much more adapted to modern life. Do you buy that? Oh my God, yes, I do. And uh, I'm studying this and I have a mea culpa as a scientist to do and um, explaining myself. The first one to talk about stress mindset 
the name of the person is Crum, and he did a very interesting study. Uh, he, he, he splitted people on the basis of their stress mindset. Some people, a lot of people actually, have negative stress mindset. So they will think that stress is always bad, it decreases performance, makes you sick, etc. But you have some people who have positive stress mindset. They will think, you know, they will say, well, stress is good for performance. Look at the, you know, for example, the athletes, you know, etc. And so he took people like this and brought them to the lab and he measured stress hormones, you know, in those people who had negative stress mindset and in those who had positive stress mindset. And he found that those who had negative stress mindset had much significant higher level of cortisol than those who had positive stress mindset. Now he did something more for, uh, and I think at first, just before I go with the, the, the next part of his study, many scientists now were asking, why is it? that people have negative stress mindset. If you look around you, many people will say, oh my God, stress is bad, etc." I think two, two, uh, there are two reasons for this, the media and scientists. Mm -hmm. If you look at the news, it's always negative. Everything is negative about stress. Go on your Facebook page, you know, the toxic effect of stress, etc. So people buy this because people read about this. Scientists as well, it's more popular to study negative stuff than to study positive stuff. So for about 25 years, I've studied the negative effects of stress and I found many, many important things. And it's easier for me to publish a paper on negative effects of stress than on positive effects of stress. But I decided that now that I'm old enough, I can <laughs> start <laughs> measuring the positive effects of stress so that I can help the new generation understand this. And I think I'm going to be able to decrease stress hormones by just doing this. Now, mm -hmm. let's go further. The second part of the study of Crumb. So remember, they took people who had negative stress mindset, had more stress hormones than those who had positive stress uh, mindset. For a week, he presented the videos summarizing the positive effects of stress to people who had negative stress mindset. And he was able to decrease stress hormones in these people. In contrast, he presented for a week, you know, videos about the toxic effects of stress to people who had positive stress mindset, and he increased the stress hormones. So basically, what we are reading when we are on Facebook, Instagram, the newspaper, etc., whatever it is, can have a significant impact on what we will be producing. So it's more important than ever to start talking about the positive effects of stress, teaching people about, you know, what it is that this thing can do positive for you and help them benefit from this amazing system. That's really amazing research. It, it makes sense um, <clears throat> in the sense, uh, thinking about it, if, if an individual uh, experiences some of the becomes, let's say, aware of the subjective experience of stress, like an elevated heart rate or so a higher level of alertness or increased respiration rate or whatever, and they interpret that as a bad thing, right. that will very quickly create a, a feedback loop, right? Yep. And I think that uh, I'm speculating, but I, you know, I receive a lot of phone calls uh, from teachers and professors and uh, teachers and parents, for example, about this new quote unquote epidemic of anxiety school uh, performance mm -hmm. anxiety and children and uh, everyone is freaking out why is it that you know all these children have performance anxiety or anx anxiety at all and there are many many reasons for this um, and we have to make sure that there really is an epidemic first but anyway what I think one of the reasons and you allude to this uh, exactly is that the first time your child had a stress response, Perhaps you did not tell them because you didn't know yourself that it's normal. You know, when you have a stress response because something stressful happened, yes, your heart rate will increase. Yes, your perspiration will increase. Yes, your, all your senses will increase. And it's a scary response the first time you're exposed to it. But when my kid had the first, my kids had the first response since I'm a stress scientist, I said, no, 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 no. It's perfect. Check it out. See what's going to happen. This and this, but it's okay. Use this. This is, you know, strength you can use, etc. But if anyone, if no one ever told you that, you can develop this, and I'm sure you know about this, so what is called um, anxiety sensitivity. Mm -hmm. People are becoming very sensitive to the 
physical manifestation of a stress response. And it is as if they were becoming phobic of this physiological response. And every time they have this response, which is normal, they freak out and they don't know what to do with it. The part that I'm struggling with a little bit there is that it is just as biased to think of stress as a positive thing as it is to think of it as a negative thing in the sense that there is an upside of stress, but there's also a downside to stress. So we don't want to become just as diluted or just as exaggerated in the opposite way, right? Absolutely not. And this is where the most important variable, the one that everyone forgets about, comes into play. Time. We always forget about time. You know, stress, an acute stress response is always good. It helps you survive. If you, if you, if our ancestor didn't have a, an acute stress response, they would never have been able to kill a mammoth, for example. The problem with stress only appears when this stress response becomes chronic. So let's say your child, you know, crosses the streets, almost get it, have a stress response. It's normal. It's good. Now, if this child, for example, starts developing a social phobia or whatever, and he or she has a stress response every morning uh, going to school or something like that, the stress response is becoming chronic. These stress hormones crosses the brain every morning, access the brain, and do something on cognition and on emotion, and your child is becoming socially isolated, etc. Yes, this is the negative part. So it's exactly the same system, the same response the same hormones, but time is the important variable here. Okay. Well then in that case, it is appropriate to have a negative stress mindset when you're in a chronic stress phase or you have an anxiety disorder or something like that. And then, and then you're stuck in this feedback loop that I referred to earlier. Well, I dream of the day where no one will either have a negative or a positive stress mindset because it is as a fixed mindset, right? Mm-hmm. I, I'm dreaming of the day where people will just know what stress is and understand that acutely it's positive, chronically it's negative. So you have to present a, you have to prevent the, this positive response to become negative. And you just know where you stand in this, you know, chronology and you have the tools you need to prevent a positive stress from becoming a negative stress. But so you don't need just, to get stuck in a mindset. Right. It's just a fact of the current state of our bodies and it's neither catastrophic nor fantastic and we just respond accordingly right exactly exactly so i will never go and say you need stress no but you have to understand this is a friend but it can become an enemy if you don't take care of it and so the 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 other piece of that study that i'd like to follow up on just briefly is this the intervention piece that this person was able to nudge mindsets one way or another and it had the physiological consequences what is your sense of the best way to shift people's mindsets about stress social media i'm going to work on this <laughs> social media because it works and many many studies now are uh, studying emotional contagion on social media. For example, what they do, uh, there are some ethical problems with this because you cannot go on Facebook pages of people without telling them. The first studies, they did that. They got, you know, uh, uh, some kind of advice from the ethic committee saying, well, you have to ask people if you can read their Facebook page. Now it's done. But what you have, what they have done, for example, they, they have put, they have modified the Facebook uh, news fa- feed of people on the East part of the United States Mm -hmm. to present them with more positive news than negative news. And then for a week, they looked at the contagion of these, you know, sharing and how much people were, because they found that when people receive positive news, they share positive news and they give positive news. And they have tracked the emotional contagion of this positive or negative news from the East to the West in the United States for a week, for example. And it's amazing to see this going. So I think that social media, because of this emotional contagion that we can put, uh, we have put a lot of negative. I've done a, let me just give you another example. In 2012, I've done a study, uh, and it's 
based on a personal story. Uh, you, I don't know, you remember in, in 2000 around, Cédrica Provencher, this young girl, was yes. abducted. Yes. And she has the same age as my daughter. And I like to wake up very early in the morning to read my newspaper, drink my coffee before the kids, uh, you know, were up now they're old, but before they were, uh, uh, you know, getting up in the morning, etc. And I was reading the newspaper and it was written, you know, will we find her uh, murdered, etc. And I sensed a stress response and I can recognize this very easily. And I said, well, 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 the brain is a detector of threatening information. Could it be possible? That when I'm reading this, even if I don't have a real stressor in front of me, the brain does its job, detects a, the threat, and I'm producing stress hormones. That would be very interesting to understand why we have so much. So I, the beauty when you're a scientist, you can come back to the lab like I did and say to the team, we do this. So we've done the study. So basically what we have done, we expose people to either, we had two groups. One group was exposed to negative news. And these were real newspaper clip that we took from the newspaper. They were all negative. I don't know. The next time you read the newspaper, look at the valence, positive or negative, of what you read. 97% of it is negative, always. Even in the financial uh, KE, for example, you know, or the health section, for example, we know because we've done the study, uh, when, if you look, for example, in the health section, you're going to have something like uh, the association between cranberry juice and uh, uh, this type of medication and explosive cocktail. You always have a word that is negative somewhere. So, so we took uh, some of these negative news and we had people read them and we measured their stress reactivity afterwards. And we had another group who was exposed to neutral news that we took in the newspaper. And let me tell you something. It was so difficult to find neutral news. It, it took us forever. <laughs> but we finally were able. And what we found is that this was particular to the women. We don't know why the women were more responsive than the men. But we found that when women read negative news only, they're significantly more reactive to stress afterwards. We also measured their memory of the positive, uh, of the neutral or negative news 24 hours later. And the, the women were remembering something like 30% more of the negative news. So we think it doesn't have an impact on us because it's just oh, reading the newspaper or reading our Facebook pages while drinking a coffee in the morning. It does have an effect particularly in women. I don't know why. So just to let you know, I told you that I'm going to start measuring positive news and I'm doing this right now. I have a journalist, a colleague of mine, who decided I love what he's doing. Um, his name is Laurent Imbo, and he decided to create a website just for positive news. And if you feel bad in the morning, just go read this and tell me how you feel. It's amazing. It's called Goodness TV. And it's only positive news. So I decided to work with Laurent and I said, well, I'm going to redo this study, but with positive news, see what it does. A bit like what Chrome has done for the mindset, but using the media. And we are actually doing the study so that I don't have results for you, but just to for you to understand that we went through, you know, these stress hormones go back to the brain, affect the way we process information. And we're going a bit further, how social, you know, determinants of this can impact on our physiology and the way we feel on a day-to-day -day basis. That is totally incredible. It also makes me think about, well, I'm not sure you're familiar with uh, Steven Pinker's latest book, and he's really interested in how, you know, biased our perception is of, you know, how humanity's doing these days, um, claiming that, you know, we're safer, healthier, happier than ever before. And yet, we're, as you said, sort of consumed by all this bad news and a more discouraged outlook. And one of the pieces he explores in the argument is that for whatever reason, news media has discovered that bad news, negative information gets people's attention more effectively. And so there's just this arms race um, in the news media to find more and uh, more attention grabbing and more alarming information all the time. But that makes mm -hmm. it so much sense because remember what I told you, the brain is a detector of threat. That's why it works. The news media is running basically on an advertising model 
as is uh, social media, Facebook especially. And so all these thousands of very smart behavioral scientists trying to find ways to grab and keep our attention on the screens, um, the same dynamic is playing out. So Facebook has become uh, perhaps aided by um, some meddling intelligence agencies in other parts of the world, but it's become basically a, an outrage and a fear generating machine because that's what keeps people's eyeballs on the platform. And so how does this, first of all, it's incredible to think about the fact that this is actually on a moment to moment day to day basis impacting our stress system. Mm -hmm. And also uh, it creates the challenge especially if we're in this business model, uh, the advertising model, people are just going to be less attracted to the good news website. I'm not sure. I'm not sure because the brain is a superb machine for adaptation. If not, we're dead, right? So uh, I love the new generation of kids because, and I'm just speculating here, but why do you think social media are so interesting for the young people young people don't share that much news they share personal stuff mm -hmm. and when and and if you start looking at the social media of kids not with without any judgment they're not sharing negative news and actually there's a study that came out showing that it's mostly older people our grandparents who share the negative stuff and the negative news, and they're very anxious about this. Young kids or young adult, teenagers, etc., share their own pictures. And most of these pictures are like me at a party, me at this, me at that. There's a positive aspect of this. I'm, the way I see the brain, the brain will go another way to find what it needs. And perhaps this new generation, and I'm totally speculating, I know that I'm doing this, but what I see when I see these picture sharing, etc., oh, you're so nice, thank you, I love you, me too, etc., there's a lot of positive in there as well. I know there's a lot of exposure, etc., but there's a reason perhaps to this, uh, that an unconscious reason that we, don't, we are not aware of, mm -hmm. that may be one way that we're getting out of this negative thing. And I remember giving a, an interview at TV, or I don't remember where, but where I said, all this negative news, and one day, someone will raise this point that the media may have a public health effects that cost a lot of money. And I hope that one day someone will calculate how much it costs because it, it is really a public health effect. And more and more, I'm not sure that we're going to go against positive because um, one of my students is working on the project of Goodness TV. And there is a new um, tendency in journalism that is called positive journalism. So mm -hmm. you have a lot of journalists at this point who are starting to raise these points saying, well, okay, so we're going to need a little bit of more positive. So I have faith in humanity. I'm pretty sure that we are going to go the other way, at least a bit. Well, I could tell you this has been very important for me uh, in terms of understanding what I'm sharing, what valence uh, of information I'm putting out there. So I will definitely be adapting my uh, behavior online. And it's also, as you just sort of mentioned, provides a little bit of hope in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of concern about how much time kids are spending online, but maybe we need to really understand what exactly they're doing and it might have some upside as well. Oh, I've been uh, reading a lot on this and actually that's exactly what scientists do. You know, each time some scientists start working on something, the first thing they measure for about 10 years is the magnitude of the effect. So the more time kids spend on the social media, the worse they are, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then it gets boring. So the next phase in science, and it's always like this, they are going to start studying the nature. What is it that you're doing on social media? It's not just the time. And new studies are showing up, showing that what you do on social media has a very important impact. And let me just give you an example. My son is always on his iPad. And one day a friend was in my home and said, well, your son is a lot on his iPad. And I said, yeah. And this person said, you have no problems? Absolutely not. Do you know why? Do you know what he's doing on the iPad? Because what you're seeing is someone, you know, like just sitting with a, with a technological advice. I said, he's reading. And he's been reading these three books at the same time, etc. One on this and one. But if he was sitting here while we we're having a coffee, 
reading a real book, you would say, ah, your son is such an intellectual, he's reading a book, etc. But this is exactly what he's doing. So we have to look at the nature of what people are doing on the, on the internet. And what they have shown as well is that different type of personalities are uh, attracted to different type of social media. And for example, they have split the social media in two ways, just to start. One is all the photographic media. So Instagram, Snapchat, all these things where you take pictures, etc., and more of the verbal, written media, Tumblr, Twitter, etc. And they have looked at people and what who are the you know big users of the photographic media versus the written media. There's huge differences. So for example, they show that teenagers that are using most of the Instagram and the photographic are extroverted young, uh, you know, like not shy, agreeableness is high, etc. And those using the written are more intellectual, a higher level, a bit of hostility. This is why we have more of a, you know, the bullying on these type of a, of a media, etc. So we have a, not a lot of data at this point, but we are going to start looking at the nature because it is what you read, not necessarily the level of the, the amount, but exactly what you read that may have a bad impact on your stress system, for example. That just makes so much sense, and I'm so glad that research is heading in that direction. Um, there's so much a kind of alarmism and pessimism about what, let's say, adolescents are doing online, but this is obviously a very key bit of information. I wanted to ask you, you seem to have taken on, in at least in recent years, correct me if this has always been a part of your professional activities, but you seem to really be passionate about education. You're not an ivory tower scientist just in the lab doing cortisol analysis and this sort of thing. Where does this passion for education come from? Walking the dog. I'm joking, but it's true. I, I, I'm known for, for walking my dog about uh, 25, day, uh, 25 uh, times a day. When I need to think, I walk the dog. And uh, one day... I've been, a, you know, these high level scientists and why, wanting to write papers and the best journals and I did and very successful, etc. And let's say that a good CV for a scientist would be, for example, you write, uh, because in science, the more scientific papers you write, the better you are, because each scientific paper is a discovery and you cannot duplicate them. So if you have six papers a year, you have made six discovery, for example, okay? And so let's say a good CV for a scientist is six papers a year. And let's say this year I had 10. And I was walking my dog and I was about 40, 42 years of age. And I was walking the dog and I said, well, this year I had 10 papers. What's my next objective? 11? <laughs> and then it got very boring for me. I mean, and I didn't see any purpose in this because so what? Anyway, the public doesn't even have access to these scientific papers because they are published in such papers that no one knows. It's only scientists. It's all this big story with all the scientists in their, in their university doing this. And I got very, very bored. And at this time, I had just finished a study where I had found, I had measured the cortisol in uh, children who go from elementary school to high schools. And I have found that many, many of them have a significant increase in stress hormones and that we cannot explain by puberty. And this is usually the, at the time of school transition, you know, when our kids go to high school, that we first see the first problem arising, depressive symptomatology, suicidal uh, uh, ideation, etc. Most people will think it's, you know, uh, puberty. But I said, well, what about if it's stress? Perhaps we could do something. And it was the time where my kids would enter high school in about two years. And I said, well, I'm there. I found this. This was a very popular scientific paper, very good for my CV. And what am I supposed to do now? Publish an 11 paper and put this, you know, results and forget about it? No way. I mean, my kids are going to go to high school. I'm not going to let this happen. So I decided that from now on, everything that I would do would need to have a purpose for the public because I, I'm, because it was possible for me. What I want people to understand is that every scientist works on a building block to find something. So we still, you, you have a lot of scientists who work on stuff that may not have a 
actual interest for the public because it's so complicated and so basic that it cannot. And these scientists have to continue doing this. But me, I was working on human stress. So I said, I can do this. So I can give this objective from now on that everything I do has to have a significant impact. And I don't care if my CV goes down and I don't have all these big levels. I don't care. I just don't care. And this is the day I remember this day very, very uh, easily that I decided to do this. So I came back to the lab and I said, we are going to do a program where we know about stress. We're going to give these kids who go to high school a program where we can help them at least. We are going to validate the program, make sure that it decreases stress hormones, doesn't increase it, you know. And this is what I have done. The program is called De-Stress for Success. It's been one of the most successful thing I have done in my career. And this now, after the, with the De-Stress for Success program, we, uh, what we do, I said, I cannot go into the high school every year. I'm a scientist. I have to stay in the lab. So every year we train teachers. They come to our lab and we train about 400 teachers every year. We train the trainer on the program. They go back to their school and they give it to children and they tell us how many they have tested. And so far we calculate that through the help to the collaboration with the teachers, we have educated on stress about 72,000 kids. Mm -hmm. This is much better than any scientific paper that I could publish in these big uh, high top journals, etc. And this is when I really started to have fun as a scientist. And I can tell you that today, not one of my study will not be performed if it has not been pushed by the public. I, I will very, very often ask the public, but what's next? What should I study? What is it that is important, you know, and many people have different aspects, but, and I pick it up from the, from the people and then I bring it back to the lab, give back the results and I'm having so much fun. That's incredible. If you don't mind, what are some of the elements of this intervention? Well, what you have to understand, and it's good that we talk about this because I didn't have to talk to you about the most important information I wanted to give to your audience is what are the determinants of stress? Because yeah. think about it. I told you <clears throat> when your brain detects a threat, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> it produces stress hormones and these stress hormones can do all sorts of things. Now, the question that came is, that, okay, what makes you produce stress hormones? What are the determinants of a stress response? The first thing you have to, the, the first distinction that we made was between an absolute and a relative stress war. An absolute stressor is a real threat for your survival. Someone comes into your house and, and shouts fire. You're not going to start talking to me about it. You're going to run, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of stress, absolute stressor these days because we're not in Syria. We're not in Afghanistan. We are in a very wealthy, educated, healthy uh, society. Yet the World Health Organization predicts that by the year 2020, this is next year, by the way, Depression related to chronic stress will be the second cause of invalidity in the world after cardiovascular uh, disorders that are related to stress as well. We have a problem with this because I don't know if you realize, but there's no more mammoth. We're not in these, you know, war zone, and yet we're suffering. And this is where scientists came up with this notion that we're suffering that much because we are surrounded not by absolute stressor, but by relative stressor. What are relative stressors? It took about 17 years, but scientists found that there are four characteristics of a situation that will induce this physiological stress response that we were talking about, the activation of the HPA axis. It's beautiful. We don't have 28. We have four. And I challenge your audience to find a situation in their life that they find stressful, that they cannot explain by at least one of these characteristics. They won't be able, I'm pretty sure. And what you have to understand is that you don't need to have all four characteristics to have this activation of the HPA axis. You, you need one. The more you have, the worse it is. So basically, these four characteristics are novelty, unpredictability, so the situation has to be unpredictable or unpred uh, very highly unpredictable. It must be threatening to your ego. And someone threatening your capacity to do your job at the coffee machine on a Tuesday morning in front of colleagues, for example. And the little feeling you have when you go back to your office, it's called a stress response. And most importantly, you must have the feeling you don't have control over the situation. I can assure you that e I'm doing this in the lab every day, that each time your brain is exposed to one or more of these four characteristics, you will produce a stress response. And we came up with an acronym to help people remember it. You know, 
the students, for example, we say stress don't go nuts. N for novelty, U for unpredictability, T for threat to the ego, and S for sense of low control. So each time you are exposed to one of these characteristics, you will produce a stress response. This is what we teach to the children in the De-Stress for Success program. We also have created, because we created the program for their parents, because when I did the De-Stress for Success, I had parents calling me saying, well, my kid came back home and I was talking about my stressful day to my wife and then the, my son, who never talks because he's a teenager, it's a joke, starts and looked at me and said, well, for sure, Dad, this is a stressful day because it was novel, unpredictable. You didn't have control over the situation and it was threatening for your ego. And the dad tells me, says, well, that made a lot of sense. Can you teach us this? So we have created a program for the parents that is called Stress Inc. It's an e-learning program that people can go to at the, the parents or the workers or whatever. And uh, we will teach them about the nuts characteristics and how we can deconstruct the situation to better understand it. For example, Sarah stresses me at work. Is it because she's novel? Is it because she's unpredictable, etc.? And then we help people make sense of their stressor. And when you make sense of a stressor, you produce less stress hormones. And that's what you want. Can you unpack that a little bit? What does it mean to make sense of a stressor? So what we teach the children and the parents, by the way, but with different program is that, okay, so when you have a stressful situation, the best way to deal with it is to first deconstruct it. For example, Sarah stresses me at work. Let me explain to you what we do with the kids. So we're going to give them a homework and you can do this at home as well. It's very uh, easy. And we give them a homework. We say, okay, for the next few days, you're going to write down all the situation that you find stressful. I got into a conflict with my mom. I got into a fight with my brother, whatever. Okay. And you're going to do a little grid. And on the grid, you're going to put the four letters of stress. N-U-T-S. And for each of the situation, you, you will put an X under the characteristics that can explain the stressful, the stressful situation. For example, got into a fight with my brother. Was it novel? No, I always fight with my brother. Fine. Was it unpredictable? Yeah, this time it was. Put an X there. Was it threatening to your ego? Yes, I lost. Put it an X there. And did you have control over the situation? No, I didn't have the feeling I had control. So now you know why it is stressful for you, why this situation particularly was stressful. A well-defined problem is a problem almost solved all the time. Once you have done this, you have deconstructed your stressor, you will reconstruct your stressor. You don't want to stop there because, you know, you need to give the feeling to your brain that you have control over the situation because with this, you will produce less stress hormones. So what you're going to do next is that you're going to say, okay, uh, this situation was uh, it was stressful because it was unpredictable. What could I do so that it's less unpredictable? And you're going to find a plan B. A plan A. A pl and after that, if you have the feeling that your plan will not work, you find a plan B. You, you find a plan C. You find a plan D. What you have to understand, and it's very important, 90% of people will never put into action their plan B. I don't care. Because studies show that when you have a stressor, if you bring to your consciousness the plan B you had to deal with it, this mere idea will significantly decrease the stress hormones because it gives the sense of control to your brain that it needs to stop producing these stress hormones. And this Having is a the plan restores that, a sense of control. Exactly. And without control, the brain will produce stress hormones, believe me. So we teach the children about this and they really, really do like it, actually. Yeah. And um, so just to finish the story, yeah. once we've done the program, and we've done the program by sitting teenagers, teachers, school counselors around the table, and we created the program. And then we put the program into the schools, and I was walking the dog, and I said, it's not enough. I want to make sure it works, and it doesn't increase the stress hormones. Perhaps it's, it does, you know, creating what we call in science iatrogenic effects. So I got a grant, and I measured the, the, the efficacy of the program in 500 teenagers going into high school for the first year. And what we've, we've done, we've measured the cortisol six times during the school year, symptomat uh, depressive symptomatology six times during the school years. And we found that the program decreases the stress hormones, particularly in those kids who start the school years with high level of anger. They don't want to be there. 
And in those kids who are okay with getting into the high school, it doesn't increase the stress hormones. It doesn't decrease it, but it doesn't increase it. it, it increase it. So we give them the information. This is all they need to make to have a plan to work with stress later on. And that's exactly what I wanted. Very cool. So Sonia, I understand that part of your uh, role at the center is to, uh, actually you've developed an app. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, in a few years ago, we received a, a fund, a money from a Bell Coast Pola Coast, let's talk about it, uh, to create some mobile application for mental health uh, and stress in uh, children, teenagers, and adults. And with the help of this fund, uh, my lab created a mobile app that is free, and it's called iSmart for Stress Monitoring and Resolution Technology. It's basically a detector of chronic stress. I told you the, the bad thing is chronic stress. So the way it works, it's quite fun, is that you will tell iSmart how many times per day you want the app to call you. And at the time you decided, the phone will ring, and it will be written on a scale of 1 to 10, how much stress do you feel? And you put a number and you forget about it because this is what we do. We forget about it. And that's the problem because it accumulates. Now, the thing is that there is an algorithm in iSmart that will make it so that when it detects a pattern of chronic stress, it will call you. And then it's going to be written, uh, beware, I detect a pattern of chronic stress. If you're every Tuesday at 4 p.m., you score very high. Do you have a particular stressor? Most people will not have a particular stressor. If you have one, get rid of it. But if you don't, then people can go on what we call phase two. The, uh, the, the app will ask you, do you want to go on the second phase? You're going to say yes. And then it's going to work this way. Each time it calls you to ask you whether you are stressed, if you score high, it will ask you four additional questions. The first one, is the situation novel? Is it unpredictable? Is it threatening to your ego? Do you have sense of control? So you see exactly where I'm going with this. It will help you deconstruct and reconstruct your stressor so that you can eliminate as it goes these chronic stress. It has been validated with uh, chronically stressed workers and it works very well. Many people were able to detect chronic stress that they never thought they would have. And when they look back, they said, God, I never saw this one coming, but it's so true. And then they can work on it before it gets under your skin. And it's free. It's free because the teenagers told me that it was too expensive, 99 cents. I said, okay, then it's free. You have no reason not to use it. <laughs> so how do people get it? Like from the app stores on their yeah, devices? It's only on iTunes because we didn't have enough money to put it on Android. I, I think it's being worked out this right now, but I'm not sure. I don't think we have the money for that, but it's on iPhone at least. And uh, you can download it from iTunes for free. Yeah. Very cool. Let's uh, stay with teenagers for a moment. A few years ago, you and I met not in person, but on a radio program. And I'll just say for the listeners that aren't aware, you're on the radio like all the time. Um, you're on TV um, and you have a very important and quite a nice media presence. And so, you know, just a credit to the success you have in the education work that you're doing. And my subject is very popular. <laughs> right, right, right. So we were on a, I guess, a, a panel discussing the role of meditation in the classroom. And um, we were on opposite sides of the debate. And, you know, as, as most people know, I'm a bit, big advocate for mindfulness meditation. I'm a practitioner myself. And I've trained many, many kids in high schools uh, and become more mindful. And you have been somewhat critical of that trend to get kids meditating in class. Maybe we can kind of reproduce a little bit uh, of that discussion and maybe I'll have an opportunity to respond to some of your uh, critiques, which I didn't get a chance on that radio program. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I've been accused of being anti-meditation by many people and I'm not. What I'm against is people advocating that uh, meditation, for example, uh, mindfulness, for example, meditation is a universal method to deal with stress. It's the universal part of it that I'm against. Because let me tell you, I've been working on stress for about 30 years now. There is no universal method to deal with stress. And I'm 
totally certain that they will never be. Why? Because we're all different. So what works for you may not work for someone else, and this is perfect. And something else we're just realizing now is that what works for you today may not work tomorrow. Why? We don't know. But when you think about it, you're not the same person you were 10 years ago. So why would you think that a you know a technique that works now should work in 10 years? It doesn't make sense anyway. So I'm against this idea of saying that there is a universal method to deal with the stress because it's not the case. Uh, and for example, um, I went to see, for example, the school director of a, uh, you know, who wanted to put these meditation in this uh, elementary school. And I said, no, there's no universal method. And then this person told me, well, you know, we won't harm anyone by having meditation done in the school. I said, oh, no, there are many studies showing that if you ask people, you know, a bit speedy Gonzalez like me, for example, to do meditation, you will increase this, these, their stress hormones. For, for about 20% of the kids in your classroom, you may do harm. These kids, you send them out, that, out there to you know, lose the mobilized energy or whatever, and the Zen kids who really want to do it, please do it, and it's going to work. So if you want to put mindfulness, yoga, Reiki, whatever you want in the school, I have absolutely no problem with this, but what you have to do in my mind, you cannot put this mandatory. It cannot be mandatory. You have to let the child do whatever they want to do when they want to do. And I remember when I said this to the school director, she looked at me, but she said, Madame Lupien, it doesn't make sense. They, they are seven years old. They cannot choose. I said, in the contra- on the contrary, Kids are much better than adults to do what they need to do to decrease their stress response. Follow your intuition. I think that the problem that we have so far is that everyone is looking outside of them for universal solutions to deal with stress. Your body has everything it needs to deal with stress. Think about it. If it didn't, we would be dead. We would never have survived to mammoths, for example. So we have inside of us what we need. So follow your intuition. One week it can be something, next week it's something else. It's perfectly fine. Many times I see parents stopping their children when they try to use unconsciously, for sure, they're seven years of age, intuitively, I must say. But we don't know about this. So it's the mandatory part. And let me give you an example. It's a study that came out, I think, last year. Um, UK, based on the idea that mindfulness is a universal method, decided to put mandatory in 6,000 schools in the UK, uh, mindfulness meditation in the schools. So they did that. And then for sure, not sure that the you know British scientists would auto-test the validity of this. So a bunch of Australian scientists decided to use this mandatory 6,000 school story to test the validity of the mindfulness meditation in the school. So they went out there and they did a very good study because a lot of studies on mindfulness, and I'm not the one saying this, but are not very strong scientifically speaking. The Australians did a really good study, exactly like, you know, very well controlled, etc. in the schools. And what they showed is that it works in, in a lot of kids, but it has significant negative impact on uh, increasing anxiety level and s- depressive symptomatology, particularly in young boys. They don't know why, but in young boys, it doesn't work that way. And it has this impact of increasing anxiety and depressive symptomatology in boys who didn't show high level of anxiety and depressive symptomatology to start with. So it is as if You cannot ask a brain to do something it doesn't want to do. The brain is not, you know, a bunch of jello that you can do whatever you want with when you want to. I mean, you have to be ready for this. And these kids, these boys, for whatever reason, may not be. And it's okay if it's like this. And let me just finish the story with this study because I found it to be so interesting. The the Australian scientists also had a good idea of asking the kids, it was mandatory, so they had 6,000 more than that schools, asking the kids and the teachers to rate how much they thought that, you know, the mindfulness had helped them on a scale of one, not at all, to 10, a lot. The score of the children, of the the, the, the kids, was 6.6. The score of the teachers was 9.2. So 
what the scientists raise is that perhaps this is something that the teachers like, but it's not that necessarily sure that this is something that the totality of kids enjoy and benefit from. And we need this subtlety in the school. And what most school directors tell me is that, yeah, but Sonia, it's difficult to not put it mandatory and leave the choice. I know, but that's my take. If you want to do this, I think that this is what you have to offer these kids if you really want to help them. So I think, unfortunately, it's going to be a pretty boring section of the podcast because I don't disagree with anything you just said. <laughs> um, there's now abundant evidence that there are plenty of aversive experiences in meditation and that I've actually, you know, from my own experience, I've taught uh, young boys and teenage boys to meditate in school and it's it was a tough slog. Mm-hmm. And so I'm totally on board with the statement that it's not a panacea and it's not for everybody. But I would push back a little bit and say, if we just get out of the hype machine around mindfulness and talk about what it really is, it's about training the mind to be more aware. And I don't, you know, you can train your mind to be more aware when you're playing hockey. You can train your mind to be more aware while you're sitting in the lotus position. I don't care about the the specifics of how you train your mind. But is it not the case that everyone who becomes more aware of their experience will be better off in terms of managing their stress and feeling more well in their lives? Well, it's going to be a boring debate, Joe, because I agree with this as well. Let me go a bit step further. Yeah, it's the hype part of it that may do harm. And I remember, because yeah, I agree, mindfulness is being aware It's being conscious of your consciousness, right? It's being attentive to your attention. It's called metacognition. Mm -hmm. And there's a scientist who did a lot of research on attention. His name is Michael Posner. Mm -hmm. And like me, he one day decided to try to put this in the school. And what I think could work, when my son or my daughter went to school and they had to learn trigonometry, They were so bored. But systematically, the teacher said, no, 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 because it can help you one day if you decide to become an engineer. And my daughter would say, yeah, but I will never become an engineer. Well, sometimes it might help you. So if we were taking the mindful part of mindfulness meditation, the same way saying, well, perhaps what we need to teach children and not put it mandatory for them to try it in the classroom. That's the important thing. Stop sitting these kids and putting it mandatory so they do something. Let them do it by themselves. You're going to go further, I think. But if we were teaching them about being attentive to their attention, what what is a what is an idea? What do you do with an idea? What do you do with a thought? Why is it that your thought will never go away? What is rumination? What is mind wandering? We would teach them this the same way we teach them trigonometry, hoping that one day they will use it. Yes, some of these kids and perhaps the young boys who is shy to do it in the classroom, when they go home and they get into a fight with their brother, they will sit on their bed alone and try it. If we can do this, yes, I'm in. But we have to do it another way, not with the, the little laum thing or whatever. I'm not, I'm joking, but you know what I mean. Yeah. We don't do the practical part necessarily, but we can teach metacognition with interesting stuff without the hype as a knowledge. And I'm pretty sure we could do a lot with this. Yeah. Okay, Sonia, I want to make sure that I get in one more question before... Um, we get to the sort of little game that I want to play with you at the end. I'm a psychologist and uh, mental health is a big part of what I do. And I wonder if you can, and I know this is a huge question, um, but I wonder if you can talk to us about the link between stress and mental health. To constrain it a little bit for you, we're all aware of some moods or some periods in our lives where a stressful experience just feels catastrophic. And so maybe we get very discouraged and we become down or depressed. And uh, similarly, we we're all aware of moods or periods in our lives where everything is stressful. So what is the link here between this physiological system and these pathological mood states? There are many theories uh, on this, but the, the oldest theories was, it, it's called a neurotoxic hypothesis. So the neurotoxic hypothesis suggests that 
chronic production, remember the word chronic here, hmm? time is important. So chronic production of these stress hormones, because you are chronically stressed, will lead to uh, atrophy of certain brain regions that you know receive these stress hormones on a chronic basis and will lead to chronic uh, to atrophy, for example, of the hippocampus, which is involved in contextual memory, learning, etc., of the amygdala, which is involved in um, emotional regulation uh, and many other stuff as well. That could explain the uh, appar- you know the, the the beginning, for example, of depression and all sorts of mental health disorders. Now, so we know from animal studies, it's true if you chronically stress a rat it will lead to modification of the brain and will put this brain more vulnerable to develop mental health disorders. We don't know why. Some people will go on to develop depression. Others will go on to develop burnout. Others will develop anxiety, etc., etc. We don't know why. But we know that, yes, it can have neurotoxic effect. And and I believe, sorry to interrupt, but I understand that you've done some research in early childhood adversity meaning some of these, let's say, neurotoxic effects uh, might be even more impactful early in life. Yes, and this story uh, started in 1995. I've shown in 1993 that chronic production of stress hormones is associated with uh, atrophy, uh, becoming smaller, of the hippocampus in older adults. And some of my colleagues had shown that high level of stress hormone was related to hippocampal atrophy and depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Those, you know, these soldiers coming from Vietnam, etc. So uh, we did, I was in New York doing my postdoc and we decided to do a scientific meeting and we called this, Can Stress Shrink the Brain? You know, it was kind of a sexy title. And we spent the day talking about the neurotoxic effects of stress and there was Roger Pittman in the room. And he didn't say a word. This is a very well-known scientist working on post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, he didn't say a word. And at the end of the meeting, he raised his hand. He says, well, you spend the day talking about the neurotoxic effects of stress. For example, those Vietnam War soldiers went to war and it's the war who created the stressor that, you know, shrink their brain and they became post-traumatic stress disorder. But could it be possible that it's the reverse? that these men entered the war zone with a smaller volume of the hippocampus to start with, which rendered them more vulnerable to develop post-traumatic stress disorder in front of a trauma. And for us, it didn't make sense because we said, come on, I mean, this is way too deterministic. It's impossible. And Roger left. Seven years later, he came back with one of the best scientific paper I ever read in my life. What he's done is that he measured hippocampal volume in soldiers who went to Vietnam and developed PTSD versus did not. And he found that those soldiers who developed PTSD had a smaller volume of the hippocampus, which confirmed, you agree, the neurotoxic hypothesis. But then he went further. And just think about how much time it took this guy to do this study. He really wanted to make his point. He said, the thing is that all of these soldiers had an homozygotic twin brother who never went to war. <laughs> and if they are homozygotic, they have the same DNA, etc. And we found that those who didn't went to war, go to war had the same small volume. So he, he, he rejected the neurotoxic hypothesis and proposed the vulnerability hypothesis, meaning that what you see when you measure adults has been there for a long time when they were young. So when you grow up in an adverse environment, you know, like incest, uh, uh, difficult parenting, etc., it will prevent your hippocampus from fully developing. So when you are adult, it will be smaller, for example, than your counterparts. And this smaller volume will make you more vulnerable to develop a bunch of mental health disorder when you have other stressful or traumatic experience. And when I read this, I realized that I may have been wrong. And in science, when you are in front of that, you have two choices. You stick with your original idea (laughs) or you try to have humility and, and you say, okay, let's say he's right. And I decided to take this path. And I said, if he's right, and I'm measuring the brain of kids who are growing up with adversity, they may not have the same brain. And this is exactly what we found. We've measured the brain of kids who grow up with a depressed mother. We know it's difficult for the children. 
And we found that they have different brain regions than the other kids. So what you have to understand is that time again, see what, what, how time is important. We always see science or we always interpret life around us as a photographic snapshot. That's the mistake. Everything has a story. So if you grow up in a very harsh and difficult environment, it will modify the developmental trajectory of your brain. And this different brain will make you more or less, it can also explain resilience, by the way, uh, it will be different and will make you differently reactive to stress when you are older. And this is exactly what we see now. Wow. So we really need to make sure that we're taking care of our little ones. Oh, absolutely. And just before, let me tell you one last thing. Yes and no to this, what you just said. In 2001, I've shown for the first time spillover effects of parental stress on children. I found that the more mom and dad is stressed, the more their own child produce stress hormones. Why? Because you become the mammoth at this time. Uh, if you are the one coming home always upset and you're unpredictable, be sure that your child will, will respond to these nuts characteristics and will produce stress hormones. And now you know what stress hormones can do to a brain. So each time I give a conference to parents, I said, way before, if you really want to help your child, don't talk to me about stress in your children. They're quite good at dealing with them because they follow their intuition. If you really want to help your children deal with stress, start by decreasing your own stress. And if you are able to decrease your own stress by 50% in the year to come, you will decrease by 50% the stress of your child. I'm totally certain of this. And what I tell parents is stop feeling guilty. If it's good for you, you feel good when you have dinner with your girlfriend every Wednesday, go. If you like playing hockey with the boys every Sunday night, go and do it. Because if you don't, Everyone will suffer in the room. You can be certain of this. In 2015, scientists have de described the first what we call stress resonance. If I bring you to my lab, Joe, and I stress you, and I measure your stress hormones, they will increase, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if I bring you to my lab, I stress you, and then I bring your wife, or no, I bring your friend, okay? And I say, you're lucky. I'm not going to stress you, but you will just sit there and observe Joe being stressed and I measure his stress hormones, they will increase at the same rate as yours. He will resonate with you. Mm -hmm. And what we have found, not me, but other scientists, is that the more there's a relationship between the two persons, wife, husband, child, parents, the more resonance there is. So as I say to parents, many parents will tell me, well, I'm the only one suffering from my stress. It's fine. And I'm always telling them, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Mm -hmm. So this is what you have to understand. Take care of yourself first. Just do this. And let me know how it goes. You will see. That's really outstanding advice and uh, really appreciate you sharing that. I'd like to move into this little final section here and it follows nicely because it is about the basics of managing stress. What I'd like to do, and maybe we can make this like a little bit more of a rapid fire sort of setup. You know, I'm a psychologist and I am a meditation teacher, mindfulness teacher, and I'm a consultant and I'm basically in all these contexts, educating people and training people to uh, manage their stress better. And I like to say, and I like to think that I'm doing evidence-based practice. And so I'd like to kind of take advantage of your presence here to validate or challenge the assumptions that I'm bringing to the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm going to make six or seven statements and I'd like to hear if you're on board with it, you could just say that's correct. And if it's not correct, maybe you can let me know what needs to be updated. Okay. Does that sound good? That's a nice game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So number one, the human stress response is analogous to the fight or flight response in an animal under threat, think the classic antelope being attacked by uh, a tiger, and it is triggered by the amygdala, which basically hijacks the, the brain into this very stereotypical and this sort of overpowering behavioral routine. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it is correct. Okay. A uh, little follow-up there. What is the link between the amygdala and the HPA axis? 
the, there are three brain regions that are responsive to stress. The hippocampus, I told you about that, the amygdala, and the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is involved in attention, emotion regulation. The hippocampus and the frontal lobe inhibits the HPA axis, so stop the stress response when, when there is too much of it. The amygdala activates it. Why? Because the amygdala is the detector of threatening information. So when the amygdala detects a threat, paf, it activates the stress response to help you survive. Okay. Does the amygdala then quiet down and HPA system takes over, or it is chronically activated with the HPA system? No, it will be inhibited by the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe will, at some point will say, okay, okay, the amygdala, calm down, the threat is gone, go back to sleep. Even if the HPA axis is continuing to do its thing? Oh, it will eventually, because the HPA axis recovery period is long. Ah, right. and it takes time, but in the meantime, the frontal will shut down the amygdala, say, okay, quiet, and it's going to be fine. Okay, great. Number two. A physical threat is not required to have a stress response. An idea, an email, an interaction with someone. So these abstract things can elicit a stress response. And even stronger than a physical one. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Number three, we can trigger a stress response by conjuring up an abstract threat in our minds. And and the example there from earlier in our conversation, oh no, I'm stressed out. That's really bad for me. I'm going to get all kinds of diseases and die. That in itself can elicit a stress response. As much as if it was a car accident. Absolutely. Great. Short-term stress is not problematic. Um, It can even be helpful. It's only long-term chronic stress that poses health problems. Absolutely. The human mind has a negativity bias, making us more sensitive to threatening information, making us more prone to remember negative uh, memories, and therefore we are more preoccupied with stressful information than we would ultimately need to be for survival. Uh, Yes and no. What I mean by that, some of the previous studies showed the human mind as a negativity bias, but more and more studies now show that it may be wrong. Actually, we may have the human mind by itself may have a positivity bias. Uh, We have a tendency to remember positive stuff much easier sometimes. What we think now is that this negativity bias can be culturally induced. Mm -hmm. You have some culture. Think about it. And this is something I always say. It's kind of cool to always be negative. It's kind of cool. You you, you look more intelligent if you're negative. And one of my friends once said, the happy people are the kitsch one, you know, like the Mm -hmm. one who's the stupid, he's happy. And the price we pay for this is very high. Be happy. I think it's worth it. (laughs) So you don't buy the theory that you know, over the course of millions of years of evolution, um, this uh, fear system ultimately takes priority because, and the little cute line is, it's more important to avoid being lunch for someone else right now than it is to get lunch for yourself. Yes, I totally agree with this evolutionary point of view, but I added, remember, during our conversation, we are not in the year zero we are in 2018, the brain has adapted. Mm-hmm. So, and, and so, yes, but I'm not sure we are prisoner of that. Sure. And it makes sense that we're highly social animals and culture is an incredibly important part of how we evolve, if not genetically, then, you know, psychologically. And so it makes sense that culture would influence our information processing biases. And it ties in nicely with the piece before about what kind of contagions we are consuming in social media. Absolutely. And I'm pretty sure that there is a cultural effect. And, uh, you know, for example, I have some friends in France. And it's true. If you go to a dinner with French people in France, it's, it looks very good to be negative all the time. I mean, they're always, but they are huge users of antidepressant as well. And I, I, it's not a cultural, you know, uh, prejudice or whatever. It's it's been known. If you go to Africa, where everything is good, etc., uh, there are some cultural bias to the way we process information. And I dream of the day where I could do this stress around the world study, where I go 
everywhere and ask people what stress is and try to see, because I'm not sure we're studying the same thing across different cultures. Mm -hmm. I will always remember this woman in Panama who told me, listen, I have 23 children. I'm way too busy to be stressed. <laughs> wow. Okay, number six. We can create chronic stress for ourselves by continually activating stressful ideas in our minds in rumination and worry. Absolutely. Okay, that was easy. Number seven, we can train our brains to be less vulnerable to stress by reframing our outlook on situations or by training our attention to be less caught up in these ruminations and worries and be more present. Well, I know where you're going with this, yes, but it won't work all the time. <laughs> Which part won't work? Well, I mean, the mindfulness is important, but I think there are other ways to do this as well. Sure. So I mentioned yeah. reframing outlook, which I exactly. think is more of a cognitive piece. Yeah. And, yes. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, one way to describe your nuts intervention. Exactly. And so, you know what? Between you and I, I don't know, you have kids as well. I mean, you do homeworks with them. You see it. They should learn about emotion regulation, attention control, etc. in the school. I dream of the day where it will be mandatory to learn this mm -hmm. just as a knowledge. And I think just with this, we will do so much. Because when I talk to parents, even the parents say, Sonia, I don't know what you talk about when you talk about emotion regulation. We right. never learned about that. So now we have all these big things, these big words, but most people don't even know how, what is an emotion, how does it, what is the timeline of an emotion, what is, you know, and there's so much knowledge that science has provided, but that never got to them, that I understand why they have so much problems. So we would really want to add another item to that list, reframing our outlook, training our attention, and also getting educated about the basics of how our brains work. Oh, yes. Maybe you can just unpack that a little bit. How do you think that sort of education helps people manage stress? Because you know. Let me give you an example. I just did a Radio Canada Chronic uh, last Tuesday. How long does an emotion last? Most people think that, you know, when they have a negative emotion, it will last forever. And now they start freaking out and ruminating, and then it increases the stress hormones. And studies show that the worst emotion you can have lasts a maximum of 48 hours. And sometimes the best thing to do, this is if you're not depressed for sure, no, but the, sometimes the best thing to do is to do nothing because the same as pain. As I was saying, I said, pain is not fun, right? But why does pain exist? Because it tells your brain, Take out your hand from the oven, it's hot, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when you burn yourself, what do you do? You cut your hand? No, you wait for it to go away. Why don't we do this for emotion? You know, many people, when they have a negative emotion, it is as if they had a hot potatoes in their hand. They don't know what to do with it. They have to get rid of it and exchange it for a positive emotion, and they're ready to give up the dog, divorce, and sell the house, you know? But if you know that, just know that, that some, most of the time, a negative emotion, sadness is the longest emotion. Shame is the, is the shortest with 30 minutes. So if you know that the longest emotion is sadness and it lasts usually 48 hours, sometimes just doing nothing, naming it uh, because it works and it goes away, don't you think it's an amazing information to give people? Sure, but what I'm understanding is that where the rubber meets the road with that education is the capacity to correctly frame what you're experiencing. So, okay, this is sadness. I'm not going to be sad and down for the rest of my life. This has a time course and I'll probably feel better tomorrow. That is a framing phenomenon. Absolutely. Okay. So then the education piece is important insofar as it helps us understand and frame our experience correctly or in an adaptive way. Absolutely. Okay. So a well-defined problem is a problem almost solved. Right, right. And it's a question of knowledge. The knowledge about the brain. Let me tell you another thing. I taught my children how the brain learns. And when you know how you learn, you can study much better. We now know about encoding, consolidation, recall, implicit, explicit. We know all of this. 
why is it that we don't teach the children in school how their brain learns so they can maximize, based on their individual differences, the best way to study? Simple as that. Right. Okay. Um, is there anything else you think I should have on that list? Or is that a reasonable sort of foundation for teaching people how to manage stress? Yes, I would add your body is an amazing machine yes. to deal with stress and, and follow your intuition. Mm. All right. Is there anything else that uh, we didn't cover that you think uh, we should include here before we sign off? No, that was a pretty nice conversation. Thanks, Joe. I agree. Thank you. Maybe you can um, just tell people where they might get more information about your research and your sort of education initiatives and that sort of thing. Well, I wrote a book in French a few years ago, which was called uh, Par Amour du Stress, which was, which was translated in English. And I had a big fight with the editor who wanted to give a very negative title to the book, uh, Toxic Stress. I said, oh, no way, <laughs> that's not going to happen with me. So we came up with a consensus. I'm not sure about the stress, the, the entire title, but the title is called Well Stressed in English. Hmm. And then the editor was able to add the toxic effect of stress below, <laughs> but in a smaller font. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure it's a, it's available on Amazon. Uh, in Kindle format or something like that. And in this book, this is a book uh, written for the public. So I really wanted to write everything I knew about stress that could be helpful for, you know, for moms and dads and teachers and whatever. And uh, it's been very, very successful uh, with the public in understanding exactly what I've been telling you and many, many other chapters, stress at work, stress in teenagers, etc. And so I think this is quite important. At the same time, if you don't want to buy anything, uh, we have at uh, the lab, we have what is called the Center for Studies on Human Stress. And we have a very, very complete website. The address is uh, www.humanstress.ca. We have it in English. And on this website, you have a lot of information. Everything we find, we put it in there. And scientifically speaking, I mean, this is all validated scientific information on stress. And we also have our official magazine that is free. It's called the Mammoth Magazine. And we have many, many issues on, you know, stress in children, uh, uh, new technology, social media and stress. The last uh, issue is uh, uh, anxiety and stress. And this is also very popular with uh, the members of the public to uh, educate them. And uh, we, we, everything we can do, we put it on this website to educate as many people as we can about everything that is found sci in the science of stress. So I think with this, uh, your audience will have a lot of information about what uh, we have learned so far. I'll just reiterate that the book, uh, among other things, has been incredibly successful. I have people in my office on a very regular basis referring to the mammoth and you know a lot of the other sort of nice digestible phrases that you have in the book. Your writing is now part of how people talk about their own stress experiences. So I think it's quite remarkable. I'm grateful and blown away uh, by all the success you're having in the space. And I really hope you keep going and keep, uh, keep your ambition super high because I think we're all benefiting. So thank you so much for doing that. And thanks so much for, for being on the podcast with me today. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for listening to the Mindspace podcast. The purpose of this project is to inspire people to cultivate well-being. The science tells us that well-being is best understood as a series of skills and habits that can be learned and practiced. And I hope listening to these episodes helps you move forward on your own path to well-being. If you enjoy listening to the Mindspace podcast, please share your favorite episodes with friends, family, and colleagues. Thanks a lot.